Hello and welcome back to Business Matters at the Hindu with me, K. Bharat Kumar. This week, we look at climate related information. Why so soon, you might ask? Because we just had a recent episode following the conclusion of the annual climate conference in Egypt or COP27. That's because both the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund have both given out stark warnings on how ill prepared the world is to meet its climate goals. But that's not all, they also point to opportunities that lie ahead of us. In this episode, we will look at two tracks of thought, both related to climate change. One is the overall energy requirement and the other is to do with the cooling sector. Last week, the World Bank put out a report in which it said India could be among the first places in the world to experience extreme heat conditions that could test even human survivability. It sounds pretty dramatic as a claim to make, but the signs are already clearly evident to us. In this report titled Climate Investment Opportunities in India's Cooling Sector, the World Bank also cites an August 2021 statement by the IPCC or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that said or actually warned that India could experience more and more frequently extreme heat conditions. And sure enough, this past summer we experienced heat wave after heat wave, which made our crops wilt, because of which we had to ban export of wheat, for example, instead of having a surplus and making use of the gap you know, that was left by Ukraine because of the unfortunate war, Ukraine and wheat went off the international markets, India could well have used that opportunity to earn precious foreign exchange. Instead, we had to ban exports in order to temper local prices. This obviously displaced farmers because they could not take advantage of international prices. The World Bank report cited extreme heat conditions. Delhi, for example, touched 46 degrees centigrade. March was the hottest month ever on record. So let's take a step back here. This report of the World Bank was in the context of cooling solutions, opportunities and threats in the Indian market. If you take a step back and look at a 30,000 foot view, let's look at our energy needs. And we'll come back to this report before the end of this conversation. Most of us are somewhat aware what climate change can do to us in the long run. But as a country, we also face the issue of energy security. Look at power supply, for example. In terms of installed capacity, Thermal power plants or coal-fired power plants account for 58% of installed capacity. It's impossible for us to just drop climate unfriendly coal and move completely to renewables. Renewables, of course, have increased over the past decade. They account for about 29% now. When it comes to transport and mobility, we still depend on forex guzzling imports to about 85% of our requirements. That begs the question, must energy security come only at the expense of climate-friendly investments? In the latest issue of the IMF's Finance and Development magazine, the International Energy Agency's chief, Fatih Bayrol, talks about failure on two counts, the globe as a whole. He says the investments in climate-friendly technologies have not been enough over the past few years to help us meet future climate goals. And second, he says even the investments made in conventional energy, like coal-fired plants, are not adequate, they risk falling short of the potential increases in demand. His take is that without investments in climate-friendly energy technologies, there's little chance that we would meet our energy goals. He is clear in his warning that even though the current energy crisis was triggered by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, as an aside, it may be noted that especially Europe continues to face an energy crisis with regard to gas supplies, high price of gas, high price of global oil prices for much of this year. So he refers to this crisis and says, even though this was triggered by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we must still pay close attention to underlying investment imbalances as we emerge from the crisis, or we risk more volatility ahead. His next question is hard hitting. He asks, are today's sky high fossil fuel prices a signal to invest in additional supply or a further reason to invest in alternatives? It's almost as if he's saying, we told you so. And even as he's saying this, there are several countries that are rushing to invest in fossil fuel based power supplies to tide over the current crisis. Where does India stand in terms of its commitments to investments in clean energy? In earlier episodes of Business Matters, we've seen that India has committed to having at least 500 gigawatt of installed power capacity relying on renewable sources out of a total installed capacity of just more than 800 gigawatts. Last week, the Central Electricity Authority put out a report stating that this journey towards 500 gigawatts by 2030 would cost 2.44 lakh crore. This would include installations, it will include transmission costs, 
and the cost of setting up about 52 gigawatt of battery storage because renewable energy is not constant. When the sun shines, the wind blows, that's when you can make energy. But then you have to store it in order to be able to use it later. While climate funding has expanded from government support to include private equity and venture capital, the real surge would come only when both investors and bank lenders are mentally prepared for longer periods of returns. According to a July report by Climate Trends, a research-based consultancy, climate tech startups have longer gestation periods, require higher capital investments in manufacturing, and have to include government regulations as an important factor in the business model. The report also points out that India can explore a model similar to the European Union's European Institute of Technology model. This fund was initially supported by the European Commission to specifically accelerate climate tech startups, but now operates and finances itself independently. India can adopt, it says, and tailor this model to integrate with Startup India. Such a specific climate fund can accelerate contributions through bilateral agencies, donors and foundations who are looking to enable climate finance as a part toward commitments and yet require official government support. As I was preparing for this discussion in Business Matters, my mind went back to an article in The Hindu in 2017, where we talked about renewable technologies other than solar and wind, which were early days for them yet, but showed immense promise. So let's see if they've moved any nearer to keeping their promises or if there are any other technologies that have cropped up. For this, we have with us today, M. Ramesh, Associate Editor Business Line, with a keen interest in environment technologies. Welcome to our conversation, Ramesh. Pleasure to have an expert like you with us. Thank you. You remember 2017, you'd written an article for The Hindu that talked about renewable technologies other than solar and wind. And it was fascinating to read. Uh, for the benefit of our viewers, can you talk about the top three or the top few that you think are interesting? Oh, yes. Solar and wind can take us only so far. There are a number of other technologies which are not today not commercially viable. But uh, as it happened in the case of solar, they will be viable once they scale up. For that, of course, they need initial policy support, some incentive support and so on. First, I would like to think of ocean energy. The, the oceans are throbbing. They're full of energy all the time. It's only left to us to tap that, that energy source. Uh, something has happened, some work has happened, has been happening in the last uh, few decades. And uh, unfortunately, as of today, they have not come to fruition because uh, they are still very expensive. But all experts believe that, uh, A, because we cannot ignore the, uh, that such a major source of energy and B, over a period of time, the costs can be tamed by several measures. Ocean energy will also become mainstream. It might take some time, but it will happen. Now, within ocean, there are uh, different ways of tapping uh, the ocean energies. Um, you see, imagine a large sea, large ocean. You know, first of all, you have these waters bobbing up and down all the time, sometimes pretty high. Those are called ocean swells. Even otherwise, they, I'm not even talking of waves. I'm talking of the bobbing motions, up and down motion. So if you have a ball on the place on the, mo on the, on the surface of wa on the wa waters, the bob ball will be bobbing, moving up and down. So that is that's happening constantly, continuously all around the year. So that that of course is kinetic energy and it can be tapped into. That is one. But secondly, you have tides moving into the land and then moving out six hours this way, six hours that way. So when waters move in, you know there is a flow and therefore there is energy. When waters move out, there is again a flow and therefore there is energy. So imagine if you place a turbine, the turbine will turn this way when it when waters are moving in and the other way when waters are moving out. Either way, all we need is the motion and we can tap into it. Tide is another. The third one is, we all know that there are underwater currents which are basically rivers within the seas. Water currents, they, they, there is water is flowing at a depth, certain depth, water is flowing one point, two, they flow for thousands of kilometers like rivers do on land. And that motion again, if you place a turbine there in the face of the motion, the turbines will turn and that's a source of energy. What is happening? What has happened? Well, unfortunately, uh, because of the difficulties, you know, initially when some new technology is coming up, it has to go through a very long, very, very long phase of, let's say, gestation phase. Uh, there have been some attempts at uh, tapping ocean energy. For example, uh, in the UK, 
uh, on the seas near Wales, there was a project called the Swansea project, uh, which exactly, you know, they built a lagoon, man-made lagoon with a small opening for waters to come in and come out. That, that's a place where tides happen. So, the tides would come into the lagoon through a small opening and then uh, they'd move out through the opening, you know, in the other six hours or the other eight hours. So, the idea was to place, place a series of turbines on the mouth of that lagoon and tap the energy as it comes out and as the waters come in and waters go out. But unfortunately, this project had to be scrapped because uh, essentially because of uh, political pressure, this was an expensive proposition and people were not prepared to pay for it. So, there are a number of initiatives happening. The, of course, even India, there is a, there is a pro project has been, that has been talked up for a very long time, uh, similar to the Swansea project uh, in the Kutch area of Gujarat, where again, the idea was to, idea is to place a series of turbines in the path of uh, the flow of water, type that energy. And last heard, that project is still not dead. So, it could, you know, they're still talking about it. Will it ever, be, how can this be tamed? How can it be brought uh, mainstreamed? I can only give the parallel of uh, solar energy. When solar was just about making an entry into the mainstream, it cost 21 crores a megawatt. Today, it is about 5. The cost of energy, they paid, the government paid 18 plus rupees per kilowatt hour of energy per unit of electricity back then in 2000. 9, 2010. And that was when the government brought in this Jawaharlal Nehru National Solar Mission. And then, as we all know, the costs kept coming down. Um, of course, partly, uh, largely because of uh, the fall in uh, module prices, thanks to China scaling up in a very large way, module prices kept falling and that, of course, helped. And that helped because, you know, there was again a demand creation from one side and the Chinese uh, took care of the supply and costs fell down. And today, uh, if somebody offers solar at more than 3 rupees, he will be out of business. The per kilowatt hour costs have come down from, so from 18 rupees to 12 rupees to 8 rupees to 7, 5 and now it actually fell very deep below 2 and then it now it has now risen for various reasons to around 3 rupees. So, if solar and on the back of the solar experience, solar experience has given us a good model, a template for us to follow with other technologies and since things are happening, uh, one would presume that in a matter of uh, perhaps not day after tomorrow, but in a matter of a decade or so, ocean energy will also be mainstream. In fact, there is no option but to do this. That is one source of uh, uh, non-solar, non-wind uh, renewable energy. The other one I would say is something that again is being talked about now. It's called, it's nuclear energy, but not those large kodam kodam type of nuclear plants. These are SMRs or small modular reactors, could be any size, could be 50 megawatts. After all, you see, it's not, not too difficult to build a 50 megawatt, 80 megawatt nuclear power plant because as we know, all these nuclear submarines have little, little nuclear power plants, nuclear generation plants. So, you can have in a, in a scenario, a series of them. The beauty of this is you can keep adding plants as you, yeah, as your demand goes. Or uh, you can, of course, it may be difficult to scrap plants, but then you can stop adding plants if you see there is not much demand. And again, I have this information from on the, on the authority of experts, nuclear experts like Dr. Anil Kakodkar, that you can, you make use of the site on which today a thermal power plant may be standing. And if the thermal power plant uh, lives its life and you have to scrap it, you can make use of that land with all the peripherals that are necessary for electricity intact, already ready there, you can site your SMRs there. So, that is again, people are talking about it. Uh, an expert by the name of Dr. Vikram Rao has written a book on it out very recently. Thank you very much. That was as insightful as always. Sure. Really a pleasure having you with us. Now that we've had a look at the 30,000 foot view, let's return to the World Bank report that talks specifically about India's cooling sector. Let's just take two of those as examples, energy saving when cooling or heating buildings and the cold chain. The report warns us that by 2030, between 160 and 200 million people across the country could be exposed to lethal heat waves annually. Around 34 million people in India will face job losses due to heat stress related productivity decline. The current food loss 
due to heat during transportation is close to $13 billion annually. By 2037, or 15 years from now, the demand for cooling is likely to be 8 times more than current levels. This means there will be a demand for one new air conditioner every 15 seconds. This will lead to more than 5 times as much in annual greenhouse gas emissions over the next two decades. On the coal chain, the report says that only 4% of fresh produce in India is covered by coal chain facilities, leading to an annual estimated food loss of $13 billion that we saw earlier. The third largest producer of pharmaceuticals in the world, India, pre-COVID-19, we lost approximately 20% of temperature-sensitive medical products and 25% of vaccines due to broken coal chains, leading to losses of $313 million a year for this sector alone. For both temperature control in buildings and protecting produce in cold chains, technologies are available, not just those that show promise, but also commercially viable ones. Take the example of Murugappa Group firm Plus Technologies. It has solutions that help transport milk from local small stables across to a central processing unit. If the journey takes two hours and milk can start the process of curdling within half an hour of exposure to room temperature, Indian summer room temperature. How do you accomplish this? Face changing materials or face change materials, PCM, seems to be the answer. Though it sounds very technical, the concept is very simple. Ice and water are examples of a face change material. When water freezes to ice, it essentially gives up energy. When ice is placed inside of or along with materials that need cooling, ice melts, regaining energy, but this energy is extracted from the materials that need cooling and hence the temperature is maintained. In some Western European nations, summertime night temperatures go down to 13 to 18 degrees Celsius, but daytime temperatures can go all the way up to 30 degrees Celsius, seen as hot in those geographies. So here's what PLUS has done. It has installed what it calls a 22 degree PCM, phase change material. What happens is this, during the day, when the temperature rises, at about 25, because it goes up to 23, 24, there's not too much of a difference between the 22 and 24, but at 25 degrees Celsius, there's enough of a difference. So the PCM starts to melt. It takes the energy or the temperature from the room. So the temperature starts to stabilize at 25 degrees Celsius. And this happens till all of the PCM is melted, by which time is the end of a workday. In this instance, it's a commercial um, application. So even if you have to do this through a longer period than just eight hours of a working day, you save on AC costs, even if you're not able to eliminate them completely. In this case, obviously ice and water, the phase change material as an example that I mentioned first cannot be used because we all know that water freezes twice only at zero degrees centigrade. So it's a mix of inorganic salts with water because the application should be in the range of 22 to 25. And similar, obviously the identical solution is not applicable in the Indian context, but similar solutions with PCM or phase change materials possible in the Indian context as well. So as we've seen, there are some dire warnings, but also there's hope because of technology improvements. With that, we come to the end of this episode of Business Matters. Till the next episode, it's goodbye from us. Have a lovely week ahead.